Okay, well, thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, I'd like to kind of uh, highlight a few of the um, studies and experiments that we're doing downstairs, some of the projects that we're working on. Uh, it's, it's quite active downstairs, uh, but I've decided that we're gonna focus on three technologies that I, I personally uh, think are um, the most promising and the highest impact. And uh, again, uh, this, this talk is basically just to kind of uh, show the story that we have as we go from translation uh, to, to development of medical devices, preclinical testing, and ultimately even um, the clinical use. So I, uh, I am a stakeholder equity owner of Serranus, Maxwell Bi Biomedical, Nanolinea, and Exxon Health. Uh, every technology that's discussed is in a preclinical uh, testing phase at this point. Uh, so we, the way we're going to organize this talk, we're going to first start uh, uh, talking about the wireless pacing for low energy and perceptible defibrillation. Uh, we'll then switch over and discuss some of our recent findings with conductive hydrogels uh, for patient-specific therapy. And then finally, we'll finish up with a little blurb about um, Excalibur, our cath lab, uh, on, uh, on a bench. And uh, we'll, we'll discuss that. And it's a, it's a really cool... Uh, opportunity, I think, for a lot of folks uh, to become involved in medical device innovation. So let's start with the low energy uh, pacing termination of fibrillation, specifically, uh, in this case, we'll talk about atrial fibrillation. Uh, we all know ICD use um, delivers typically 10 to 40 joules of energy to defibrillate the heart, and multiple shocks may be given. We also know that ICD shocks can be profoundly traumatic to patients. And it's just not a matter of ICDs. It's often you'll have patients who come in um, who have atrial fibrillation and they need to get defibrillated. And obviously that is an outpatient, uh, often an outpatient process that involves, you know, being hospitalized in the, even as a same day uh, procedure, a uh, brief period of anesthesia. But what if you could actually terminate the AFib without delivering a high energy shock without it actually even being perceptible uh, to the patient. We know that the pacing outputs, the pacing energies are about 1 80th uh, that of even the lowest intensity shock energies that are at the threshold for detection in terms of pain. Typically it's about one joules and the powers that we're working with, with, uh, with the pacing is about 1 80th the intensity and essentially completely imperceptible as anyone with a pacemaker can can tell you. So before we talk about our work, you know, Igor Afimov and his and, and the group and his group initially at uh, in St. Louis and now in uh, George Washington University in D.C. have shown that the concept of low energy termination of fibrillation is not is not a is not a crazy one for lack of a better term. But actually, you can actually do this, provided that you can deliver energy outputs from multiple sites. And you can see that if you, if you do that, the energy requirement for termination of, of atrial fibrillation gradually decreases. And, and you can actually have termination of cardiac arrhythmia delivering just by pacing from different sites, but these are shocks that are delivered. These are shocks that are typically around one joule and therefore they are actually perceptible. Uh, to, to the patient. Um, so our concept was we use absolutely no shocking outputs. We use purely pacing outputs, and this is for atrial fibrillation. So we decided let's try test this concept and let's see if this actually does work, if we can potentially terminate fibrillation purely by pacing. So we induced atrial fibrillation uh, by giving a systemic neostigmin injection, and then we gave acetylcholine uh, close to the sinus node and rapid pacing. Often you didn't even need the rapid pacing. Once you give the acetylcholine and the neostigmine, the, the, um, the uh, animals go into fibrillation on their atrial fibrillation. Um, we then delivered pacing therapy using a custom built pacemaker uh, to pace from multiple locations at varying delays. So we have uh, this uh, Topera firm map catheter that was initially used by Abbott. It's mostly for sensing purposes, but we decided to use it. It's a, it's a large basket catheter, so it works really perfectly um, in terms of putting it in the left atrium and having good contact. So that was our initial 
experiment. And what the way we actually are driving the pacing, as this cartoon will, will note, it's not just burst pacing. We're actually going sequential. We're going around the heart. And I'm going to let this play one more time. So we go around the heart. And as we go, you can see different poles are getting stimulated. So the order, basically you go in one direction and then you wrap around and you come in the opposite direction. Why do this? Well, we know that biphasic shocks with defibrillation are more effective than uh, monophasic shocks. And this is a way, and, and actually computer modeling has suggested for pace termination of fibrillation, the same fact holds that biphasic will be better than monophasic. And this is our way of mimicking a biphasic pacing train. <clears throat> So it's, it's not simple overdrive pacing. And obviously to do this, you need multiple electrodes uh, around the heart, around the atria. We induced atrial fibrillation again, as I said, um, with the neostigmine and uh, acetylcholine. We observed the duration of the, each episode. Uh, for the therapy episode, after one minute, we would provide the therapy with pacing. And in the control cases, after one minute of sustained atrial fibrillation, we would wait until the fibrillation spontaneously terminated. Uh, and this could take up to 10 minutes. Um, if there was no termination after 10 minutes, we would then uh, cardiovert the animal. And then uh, we would uh, also use uh, the time to sinus rhythm for each episode as a marker of efficacy of the treatment. <clears throat> Here's an example. Um, on the panel on the left, you can see the, so here we have the splines uh, making contact with the, with the left atrium. Uh, and here's atrial fibrillation that we induced using the neostigmine and acetylcholine. Here is the burst pacing that you can see. And you can even appreciate here, it's not a regular cadence. You see this, there's a, there, the cadence to this and the locations and the activation you see is, is, is different. But if you were to drop a, a line right in the middle, your pacing, from these electrodes moving along. And then from here, you switch around and you start pacing in the same electrodes, but in the reverse order. And essentially it becomes a mirror uh, reflection image. And then after we're done here, you can see that the animal is back in sinus rhythm. And, um, and so this was, you know, this was a very, very uh, helpful um, uh, observation. We only delivered five to eight microjoules per pulse, far, far less than the pain threshold of one, uh, 0.1 to one joule. <clears throat> and you can see here that in terms of the time maintained, time to termination of AFib, there was a clear improvement, clear difference um, in, th in a series of actually three experiments in three different animals on three different uh, days. But here's the problem. The problem is, you know, not necessarily that anyone doubts the efficacy of such an approach. The problem is people haven't been able to do it. And why is that? The reason is, as you can appreciate, there you requires a, a large number of pacing electrodes. And until now, that really has prevented anyone from, from looking into the concept or the possibility of terminating um, fibrillation by pacing. But now, and working with uh, Aydin Babakani, at, uh, who's initially at Rice and now is at UCLA as a collaborator, uh, we have uh, developed these wireless uh, powered pacemakers, uh, miniaturized, essentially one by one centimeter, and you know, down the road, significantly even smaller than that. These are powered using electromagnetic induction, much like you charge your um, iPhone wirelessly. Um, and we use these electrodes can be then delivered to terminate the fibrillation. So these electrodes are about one centimeter and they can be placed across, they can be decorated across the posterior wall or whichever location that you decide in the left atrium. They're then magnetic, they're wirelessly communicating using EM induction with a power generator that sits you know, subcutaneous as an implantable, just like you would any other implantable, but it is wireless. So you have wireless induction, you have wireless charging of the power generator, and um, you know, you're know you circumventing some of the major issues that we typically have with device therapy, which is um, battery changes and the need for complications from lead failure or device uh, malfunction or lead fracture. 
Here is another example. This is more recent. Uh, this is, uh, again, we give the neostigmine and acetylcholine. And I do want to bring this point up. Look how rapid this atrial fibrillation is. This is much faster than what we typically see in, in the cath lab because these uh, animals don't have scar. And also the neostigmine and acetylcholine work basically by decreasing the refractory period so you can activate more and more rapidly uh, given tissue. And so you get this really, really rapid atrial fibrillation. And if anything, this atrial fibrillation at this rate would be more challenging to terminate with, with, with the pacing protocol, one would expect. But you can see that even with these, and all of these studies that I show you, that's the mechanism that we induce the AFib. But you can see you have atrial fibrillation here, and then the pacing burst starts right around here, and you deliver the pacing therapy. And then after this, you notice that while it was completely chaotic here, you, sorry. While it was completely chaotic here, now you have organization on the right side. And this organization is actually something we call atrial flutter. And then the atrial flutter spontaneously terminates. Now in this, I have marked up this region here where we actually feel that the termination actually occurred of the AFib. And you can see, I've magnified it here. And if you keep a close eye here, you can see that the local activation with every pacing spike that we're delivering for therapy is now driving, that pacing spike is driving the local activation. In other words, you captured the tissue. You are now pacing the atrium. But the thing that happens is because you're pacing the atrium quite rapidly, when you come off, you have essentially gone from AFib and you've induced the atrial flutter. But you terminated FIB and the biggest proof is the fact that you are driving atrial activation with your pacing here. So that's, that's, uh, that's one of the uh, projects that we're working on. Uh, another project that we find very, very interesting and, um, and intriguing is um, using injectable electrodes uh, for improving pacing therapy and also to mitigate the risk of reentrance arrhythmias. So how does, you know, how does, how does this work? So first of all, we all know, we just discussed the limitations of pacemakers as, as they are right now. Uh, epicardial leads can uh, obviously are placed uh, transvenously uh, and all these leads, you know, with regards to especially with cardiac resynchronization therapy, their epicardial uh, leads can have malfunctions. They can have uh, dislodgement. The devices can get infected, things of that nature. And so our thought was not only that, but what if we could make something that does not use these leads necessarily, but is an extension of these leads? So in other words, you could consider using, if there was a portal to be able to paste tissues that up to now, no one could paste. And what we're talking about mostly is the mid-myocardial tissues, where most of, you know, you can often get foci for reentry where you get delayed conduction and delayed conduction is the hallmark of reentry and you know ventricular events um, uh, especially post infarct so so a couple of things if we can pace in the mid myocardium first of all you're improving cardiac resynchronization to a level that is dramatically greater than even any of the of the devices we have right now which have you know just four electrodes if you inject into the venous branches a conductive hydrogel. And if those venous branches, as, as, you, as they fill retrogradely, then come in contact with the tissue, very, very intimately, if you will, uh, with, the, with the tissue that is now, say, scarred or delayed uh, in terms of its conduction. If you could capture this entire region as it's going deeper and deeper into the mid myocardium, you're effectively turning the mid myocardium into a pacing electrode, a, a, what we call a planar wavefront activation, planar pacing, so that the entire myocardium is now simultaneously activated. Uh, we just did a study on this actually on Monday, and we we don't we have some nice images, but we still have to um, clean them up a bit. But what we found. In that situation, and you'll see a little bit more detail here, is that when you pace, you can actually create, even in areas in the mid myocardium, you can deliver that energy and you get an entire wavefront that even in the depths of scar is now activating simultaneously in the heart. And that eliminates the delayed activation 
that eliminates these delayed potentials that we often see, which is the hallmark and the and necessary condition for reentry, which is by far the most common uh, cause of sudden death is ventricular arrhythmias caused by reentry. So how does this work? Uh, here's a little, so we inject the two components of this hydrogel into the venous epicardial venous branch. They, soon as they are mixed here, soon as they're combined, then you can tune how long it takes for, for, the, for the material to gel. And you can actually also tune the conductivity of this material. Right now, the material that we have is about three times more conductive than normal myocardium. You then take a standard pacemaker, you attach it to the base of the hydrogel, and then you deliver the pacing out. And you are checking at that point to see, are you gonna be activating as a point that's spreading out? Or are you gonna be able to simultaneously, since all of this is essentially one electrode, are you gonna be able to actually activate the entire myocardium, including those little regions in the scar tissue that cause the delayed potentials and the, and the re-entry. If you can activate everything at the same time, you, you have you know, resynchronized or you have brought back the same homogeneous conduction pattern that is uh, typical of native conduction and not disease conduction. So you don't have the wave breaks that are caused by scar that, cause, that caused re-entry. So the concept of pacing this entire tissue, this planar wave front eliminates or potentially could eliminate any delayed conduction or normalize that delayed conduction so that you eliminate that substrates for re-entry. So here's a, you know, a, a little bit more of a, a materials uh, discussion of, of what is going into the cross-linking uh, to, to create these conductive uh, hydrogels. What we decided to do is we injected these hydrogels into the AIV, which may look familiar to many of us as, as, as the venous partner of the LAD. And the reason we did this is, is straightforward. If you are having, in, for this technology to work, you have to be able to localize where the scar is, okay? And at least in the case of ischemic cardiomyopathy or ischemic scars brought on by you know, coronary blockage, there is typically a well-defined vascular territory that is scarred because the occlusion is at some well-defined uh, location in the, in the coronary arterial vasculature. Every arterial bed is then drained by a specific venous bed. So now if you say you have an anterior infarct and that anterior infarct was involving, I don't know, the mid LAD, if you, the venous drainage of that tissue that was involved by that infarct is being drained by the anterior interventricular vein, which is the venous component or the venous partner of, of the LAD. Therefore, if you inject in the venous branch that corresponds to that arterial branch of that same territory, you are by definition injecting and introducing these hydrogels and this pacing ability into those exact same tissues that are scarred, that are the focus for reentry and have the substrate for the delayed conduction. So this allows you to tailor perfectly your therapy to the infarct. Now this is probably not gonna work as well when you have uh, conditions such as sarcoid or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy where you have patchy diffuse scar. But for the vast majority of patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy with scars that are due to a vascular bed being occluded, this technique will allow you to, once you know that the region of the scar, you go into the venous branch and you inject the hydrogels and um, you start pacing. And we've, we saw that you, know, you can actually pace areas that have in the mid myocardium, even over dense scar. Uh, again, this experiment, you have to take my word for it. We did it on Monday and uh, just was a little too short for us to be able to get all the data out. So, so let's talk a little bit about these ionic hydrogels. Um, you know, they, they are conductive, they must be biostable they must be cytocompatible, and they must be mechanically robust. And the data that we have to date suggests that all of these criteria are, are, uh, uh, are, are valid. Um, I, at this point, you can see that the myocardial conductivity 
is about one third of the conductivity of the hydrogels. Now, there is a concern that if you are now conducting more rapid than native conduction, well, then that can potentially be a cause for reentry too. And that, yes, that is definitely something that needs to be looked at and um, needs to be studied. But keep in mind, when we have planar wavefront activation, a very large amount of the myocardium is being simultaneously activated. And so there is the, 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 you are essentially creating a homogeneous activation time. And even if this is three times fatter, faster than normal myocardium conductivity, if you are activating a whole block simultaneously, you have homogeneity in that region. And so the chances of reentry are probably gonna be less, but again, this clearly has to be studied a bit more uh, in future studies. So the hydrogen, as I said, we mix them, you can tune the curing period, um, and then we directly inject the hydrogel into the AIB. This is our experimental setup. This is with sinus rhythm. This is us pacing actually with and through the hydrogel. And you see it, it works. And afterwards, when you take the, the hydrogel out, it's, it's quite resilient. It takes the shape of the blood vessels, uh, the venous uh, blood vessels that it was injected into. And so here's, I think, my favorite slide of all. Uh, here, other than the termination with, <laughs> with pacing of AFib, here you see uh, a baseline. And what we've done here is we have opened the chest. You have the AIV in front of you, the left ventricle in front of you. You check baseline activation. Then you start pacing on the epicardial surface with a metal. You also do what we call point pacing. So these are both point pacing with the hydrogel and the metal. And we would expect these to be the same activation. They have the same, relatively same conductive properties. Then we also did a hydrogel line, which was not injected, just a long line that we placed on the outer surface of the heart. And then finally, we injected the hydrogel. That was another arm. So you had A, B, and C, and this was the arm that we injected the hydrogels. And that's where it goes. Our hypothesis and what we found in necropsy afterwards is indeed that the hydrogels go into and take the shape of these tiny branches of the veins that are draining the infarcted region that is the source of the delayed potentials. Also, we know that the mid myocardium, at least at the septal level, is uh, where the conduction, a good part of the conduction system rests. And for us, a first step to say, okay, are we actually pacing in the mid myocardium or is this just surface pacing? Was exactly the way we did that was to compare the morphology of pacing when you have epicardial hydrogels, not in the vein, not percolating into the mid myocardium and you pace from there and you compare it to what happens when you pace with the hydrogel that's percolated in the mid myocardium. You would expect if our hypothesis is that this is approaching the mid myocardial condu conduction system, the hispertingy system, that the QRS morphology would probably be a bit more similar than native. And so here you go, you see on the top panel here, this is the native uh, QRS, so P wave QRS, P wave QRS. These are not synced in time. I just wanna be clear. So you're not necessarily gonna see an electrode or signal here for, for this, but focus should be on what this QRS looks like. This is the native QRS baseline. When we pace from the hydrogel point, and I can tell you that these all, the hydrogel point, the metal electrode and the lines were you know, it's, it's somewhat, similar to each other. You can see that here you had an initial upward deflection and now it's going down. So again, keep in mind for all these tracings, this is your normal. This is the best way to summarize it. For metal electrodes, for point hydrogel and line hydrogels, the morphology that you get is, if you can appreciate it here, is quite different than the morphology that you have at baseline. However, with the hydrogel pacing, what you see is with the pacing artifact, there's a slight delay. Note that slight delay isn't here. This, in our hypothesis, and this is something that's in, in, in the EP community is relatively well expect, um, accepted, is if you pace and there's a slight delay, that actually you're probably going into the conduction system. And this is one of the things that these days we see with left bundle pacing when, when you have a pacemaker and you're trying to actually capture the left, the mid myocardial left conduction system. You see the slight delay as the Hispertingy system is activated and therefore there's no surface activation. And then when you have the morphology of the QRS, it is substantially more similar to what we have in, um, in, in the case of the metal electrodes 
uh, or the point hydrogels or the uh, linear hydrogel uh, non-injected into the AIV. Well, we're doing all this, but is it safe? I mean, you're, you're occluding venous branches, you're doing all kinds of stuff. Well, you know, from a practical perspective, every time you put an epicardial LV lead in, in into the, you know, to do a BIV, you're, you're putting a lead that is essentially close to occlusive um, because we typically go all the way distally until we can't push that lead out anymore. So we, we're doing this right now in the venous system. And this is the venous system that, that the experiments are being done in. So that clinical uh, picture kind of uh, does give us uh, a little bit of confidence, but we decided to look into it even in more detail. And as it turns out, you, you, if you look at the level of inflammation and in, 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 uh, necrosis, uh, when we uh, did an injection, we survived them for two weeks, and then we did the autopsy, you see that there's a lot more inflammation. The, the, the vast majority of this inflammation is occurring where the, the injection was being delivered, where all the instrumentation was being done in this, in this region, right? This is the region that you know, you're instrumenting and, and things, but the more distal areas as you're going farther and farther into the AIV, farther, more distally into the AIV, you see that there is essentially no changes, no necrosis, essentially very little damage. And so this was an initial indicator that we probably are going to be okay that the venous, you know, we're not going into the major venous uh, branches, we're going into the side branches, we're not necessarily, um, at least based on this, locally even, there was no effect uh, on myocardial uh, necrosis. So here's the catheter delivery system. It's a dual plunger system. It allows even injections of the precursor so solutions. Um, and it, it becomes the two lumens go into a single lumen catheter and then the mixing occurs here. And then uh, you, you, the curing is, is pre-programmed and as I said, tuned. Uh, you prevent the backflow, you wait for the curing to occur. And, um, and that's it. And that's how you, how you do the pacing. And so more to follow, um, but stay tuned on this. And then the final thing I'd like to talk about today is catheter lab on a bench. Uh, this is an idea that I would like to shout out to Matthews John uh, and Allison Post in our, in our uh, lab who came up with this idea. And I'll be introducing you to everyone here at the end of the talk. But um, I think every one of us at some point as physicians has had a period where they said, well, you know, I have an idea. What if we did something like this? Or what if we did something like that to help of a specific pain point in, in the course of our care of our patients? Well, you know, drawing something on the back of a napkin and then actually prototyping it are two very different things. And, and this is where we hope to provide a service essentially to the community, to the medical community, where if there's a clinical need and there's well def defined requirements and there's an idea that you have, we certainly can try to help with the prototyping, the testing and the validation of, of that. And the ideas, everything remains yours, but we, we provide, we can provide this service for you. And we have actually done it already and we have published. Um, so again, a step back, um, we had a paper that we were in which we were looking uh, at different ablation characteristics for, for ablation catheters. No need to really get into the details of that, but suffice to say, you can change the settings on the catheter, the power, the duration, the force with which you are ablating. You can have irrigated or non-irrigated uh, ablation energy deliveries. You can have internal irrigation and external irrigation. But for our purposes, the thing to keep in mind is that an ablation catheter resistively heats tissue. And it does so with an AC current output at about you know, three to 500 kilohertz. The depth and the width of the lesion is dependent on these, on multiple features that I was talking about. There is, however, one other variable too. Uh, we talked about, I just discussed the power, the force, the duration, but typically RF energy is delivered in a monophasic unipolar or I should say not a monophasic, but in a unipolar fashion. And what I mean by that is that the energy comes from the tip of the ablation catheter, and then it dissipates to the back patch. Your, your, your 
your indifferent, if you will, electrode becomes a back patch. So as the energy from the tip of the ablation catheter is going away, it's dissipating. The concentration of that energy is dissipating as it goes towards that uh, back patch. If you have a tissue that is in the mid myocardium and you're trying to ablate it, you're trying to ablate tissue in the middle of the myocardial tissues. In that case, what if you want to be able to create a deeper lesion? Well, one of the things you could potentially do is instead of putting a back patch for your indifferent electrode, you bring a second ablation catheter and that becomes your indifferent electrode. That becomes the ground electrode. And when you do that, now you are not dissipating that energy. You are concentrating it and you're enabling deeper lesions to form. And you can see how that essentially works here with, with bipolar. The lesions are deeper. It traverses the entire mid myocardium uh, when you do that. So we decided that we were going to uh, look and study um, different catheter properties and different ablation properties with bipolar versus um, a unipolar uh, ablation. And so this is exemplar. Uh, this is just an example that I'm offering for what we do at Excalibur, but you, we have a simple um, setup for bipolar ablation. Um, in our second generation, we actually circulating, we had a circulating temperature uh, water bath. And this, uh, this work was actually published by Matthews and the rest of the team at, on, in Heart Rhythm. And you can then see that in our most recent Gen 3, the unipolar ablation capability and the ability to monitor temperature, uh, to monitor collateral tissue damage during ablation was there. And you can see this is the whole setup for you. And it's in a bath and we can actually control the amount of force that's being delivered to the catheters, to the ablation catheters. We have direct visualization. We can control the power that's being delivered. We can switch from you know, biphasic, I'm sorry, from bipolar to uh, unipolar uh, pacing or ablation also just by removing the catheter. So we have very good control over what we're doing. And you can see in real time, a very detailed um, granular analysis of different results on the tissues when you alter some of these pacing, uh, or some of these ablation variables. And now for the more most recent, there's a, we want to have, and we do have precise catheter control, a precise bath temperature and flow control. And we have a stationary and different electrode. And right now we basically can look at different properties, different ablation variables, again, as I was discussing earlier, and analyze in real time what is happening. And it's, a, it's really remarkable to see the tissue changes in front of you in real time. I think that anyone who ever touches an ablation catheter should at some point, early on, preferably, uh, see what the ablation, what, what this does to the tissue. And so this is a perfect um, opportunity for that. And to have future studies, to have better understanding. For example, one of the other things that we are looking at right now is the concept of um, insurance lesions, where an EP very frequently we will have, we will do an ablation, we'll see a good result and we'll say, okay, let's just stay there and give another burn as an insurance lesion. Do these insurance lesions work or not? Well, we looked into this and uh, stay tuned. It should be uh, out in press here, hopefully in the next few weeks. But uh, the bottom line is that uh, I would advise you not to do an insurance lesion. <laughs> uh, these are the publications we've had recently. And, um, and um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's been ramping up. Uh, and we look forward to having a 2022 that is even more productive than our 2021. And of course, this couldn't happen without help, uh, grants. Um, the McDonald grant has been extremely helpful at the earliest stages to give you that initial money that you need to start those first few experiments to build on it. Uh, we've been collaborating with electrical engineers at, um, at Rice University. And um, uh, we have a patient specific uh, multi site in order to create kind of a patient specific type programmable multi site pacing to terminate the atrial fibrillation. In other words, we look at the sensed events and correlate atrial sensing with the substrate of fibrillation so that we can give the appropriate 
pacing therapy. We have an R01 um, NIH uh, uh, R01 looking into this, uh, this, this concept, and we have been uh, blessed with philanthropy from a number of uh, foundations. Our collaborators across the country, but mostly obviously focused in, in Texas. And here's the team, uh, Allison Post, uh, Matthews John, Skylar Bucken, uh, Drew Bernard, and Payam Safavi Naini. And that is it. Happy to take any questions and thank